you present. It's an honor to be able to participate in this important meeting. And I would like to continue the presentation in, in English because it's a, a language that I use frequently and I would not like to, to miss out on some important words. So thank you very much. I would like to carry on now the conversation. I was given quite a bit of time and I do hope that I will use this time in such a way that it will be not only interesting, but hopefully also entertaining. Because whatever we do, even when we talk about inclusive education, that can be a very important, sometimes heavy topic, I believe has to be done with uh, lightness because it has to be a pleasant experience. And it has always been very pleasant for me to attend the meetings of Zero Project. And, uh, and I, I learned a great deal. So allow me first to be a teeny bit more formal. It is a real great honor for me to be here today with, uh, with you all and contribute to the Zero Project initiatives to address innovative practices and policies, as well as to share with you some experiences to create a dialogue that will hopefully help us in exploring and anticipating together possible futures for governments and policymakers to consider for the well-being of the people and the planet. And there is no need to say that the United Nations supports ongoing efforts towards policies that promote inclusive and accessible education for all people of all ages and of all abilities as one of the futures we want post COVID-19. I have to admit that I was personally touched by the topic of inclusive education. And you know why? Because it brought me back of, alas, 53 years. 53 years ago, when I was turning six years. I recall it was May 1967. Yep, I'm 59. And in those years in Italy, I'm Italian, school was starting in October, every October. And you know what happened in May 1967? In 20 days, I became from a child who was running and biking. In 20 days, I became paraplegic. So since then, I started using the wheelchair. Now, what happened with my, what was going to happen with my education? We have to go back of more than half a century ago. And in Italy in those years, there was no law that was including children with disabilities to the ordinary school. There were only special schools. And in those years, special schools meant that all children with disabilities, sensory, physical, mental, as long as they had a disability, in those years we were called handicapped had to go to the special school. I was very lucky. My parents fought like lions and then lioness to allow me to attend the ordinary school because they said, look, until two months ago, three months ago, this child was running. What has changed, if not prejudices and architectural barriers? So I was lucky again, not only my parents, but also the dean of the primary school. She was very avant-garde. And she said, well, the only thing that has changed in this child is that instead of having to often change the shoes, she will have to change more often the tires of the wheelchair. I was so blessed. So illegally, I was an out of law. For three years, I attended the ordinary school and not the special school. Why three years? Because three years later in Italy, finally, the law that said that there were no discriminations and that all children with and without disabilities 
had to be included in the same classes. And so finally I started a joint inclusive education. And from there, you know, I went on and on and on. It hasn't been that easy, even though there was law, until I graduated at the university and that allowed me to have the first employment. That was a major step. So to get out from the vicious circle that was the destiny and the future in those years of persons with disabilities to be either unemployed, poor, isolated, closed in institutions, or at best being allowed to be a um, phone operator or maybe a door person or a masseur. No. Let's go back now to the theme of today. But you see, it was important. If I wouldn't have enjoyed inclusive education back in those years, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I have the baton in my hand, and that's what I have now to transfer to others. And others has, have to carry on this uh, journey for other people in the future to enjoy real, full, inclusive education. Now, let's go back to the theme now uh, of where we are today. Now, today, although I will focus a tiny bit more about children and youth with disabilities, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, it, we all have to keep uh, following our long life learning education. The world has changed. Still, it is very important that we provide children with disabilities in the very early stages of their life with key tools that they have to put in their luggage. In their luggage, they have to have as many tools as possible because those tools are preparing them for their journey ahead in adulthood. Education, formal or non-traditional, is a lifelong process and we need to remain updated with the new skills to respond to the needs of the labor market, either as an employee, or an employer, an entrepreneur, in providing products and services and so on. So this applies to all and for persons who as adults might acquire a disability or have one, it is even more challenging, either because of lack of education to find employment, for instance, lack of access to transportation and or places where education to children and adults is available if they needed to retrain themselves. And then it's also because of lack of financial needs, persistence of prejudices, social inequalities, and inaccessible places. So persons with disabilities remain less likely to attend school and complete primary education with their kids and more likely to be illiterate than persons without disabilities. So the link between poverty and disability, as you see, is one of the factors underlying the persistent exclusion of persons with disabilities also from employment later on. Now we have to break this vicious cycle and we do have international tools to do that. We have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and we have 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations 2030 um, uh, Agenda for Sustainable Development that has as a motto leaving no one behind, neither countries nor people. And this includes education, inclusive education. Now, my presentation is divided in three parts. The first is about the meaning of inclusive education and some practical examples. The second is about the COVID-19 crisis and education with references also to Latin America. And the third, we look more into the UN activities before my final conclusion. So let's go to the first part of my presentation, which is inclusive education and some examples. Now, what I define as inclusive education is when all students, regardless of age, 
or any challenges they may have are placed in age appropriate general education classes that are in their own neighborhood schools to receive high quality instructions, interventions, and supports that enable them to meet success in their core curriculum. And I took this definition from, as you see, the reference, Bui, Kirk, Almazan, and Valenti uh, from 2010, and Alquery and Gat from 2012. I liked it. Now, the school and the classroom that must be physically accessible and usable by all children, parents, and teachers with or without physical and sensory disabilities or other kids' own kinds of different uh, disabilities. Now, schools and classrooms operate on the premises that students with disabilities are as fundamentally competent as the students without disabilities. So successful inclusive education happens primarily through accepting, understanding, and attending the student differences and diversity, which can include physical, cognitive, academic, social, and emotional ones. So some students might sometimes need to spend time out of regular education classes, for instance, for speech or occupational therapy. Sure, however, this is the exception, not the rule. All students need the opportunity to have learning experiences in the same line, learning the same goals. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of inclusive education. Inclusive education in practice, what is that sport? Education includes also sport and physical activities, right? And they are very important for our physical, emotional, and mental well-being. Now, all students of all ages have the right to fully participate in all activities and interact with peers of all ability levels with opportunities to develop friendships. You know, when there were gym classes and I was attending them, um, yeah, okay, I couldn't practice some of those sports, but maybe I was uh, trained to be a coach or a referee, or I was just there as fun, uh, you know, um, yelling and screaming and encouraging my, my, my friends and my, my peers uh, to score a goal. So that was an amazing way through sport also to educate kids about other abilities that maybe I had and they did not, and vice versa. So I was developing friendships, engagement in active, values-based life and social skill, skills learning, either in formal education settings, physical education classes, as I just mentioned now an example, or non-formal, informal education settings in the community or sport clubs. And it should also form part of the approach in mainstreaming inclusive education in sport, in national development policies in the post-COVID-19 era. And about the COVID-19 crisis, I will mention a few things later on. Another example of inclusive education is applying universal design in learning. So the role of new and or assistive technologies is so important. Technology, in fact, has the ability to enhance relationships between teachers and students. And technology helps making teaching and learning more meaningful and fun. And students are also able to collaborate with their own classmates through technological applications. So accessible technology that incorporates the principle of universal design can serve as a very important role in inclusion of students with disabilities, at least some kinds of disabilities. It depends. Some children might not need uh, assistive devices. Some, some do. So accessible technology can be used by a, a wide variety of people, including persons with disabilities. And its primary purpose is to make sure that people with disabilities can really fully participate being accessible and can be used by and benefit really everyone. Even a teacher who might have a disability or a parent of a child with disability 
um, all of that, you know, belongs to the to the cycle and circle of inclusive education. And if through technological technology material, if, if technology materials are are accessible, students with certain disabilities, for instance, sensory or learning learning ones like dyslexia. I do have quite a few friends with dyslexia, and you know, with the, some technological support. They could fully participate and learn from the material, and they were absolutely uh, fully included because they were not left behind. In many countries, continue to strengthen social policies and legal frameworks to improve access to education for persons with uh, disabilities. However, in spite of all of this, in the year 2017, so three years ago, only 34, 34 out of 193 United Nations member states were guaranteeing in their constitutions the right to education for persons with disabilities or providing protection against the discrimination based on disability in education. And yet, in in 44% of United Nations member states, students with disabilities cannot be taught in the same classroom as other students. So despite this, in any case, there has been some progress. In fact, in these recent years, 41% of countries, uh, again, making reference to the year 2017, as opposed to 17% in 2013, so a big increase, uh, provided appropriate material and communication to support the inclusion of students with disabilities in their schools. So let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by accessible materials. Closed captions on videos, alternative to sound cues, logical order to content that is easy to understand. Navigation, you know, mouse free. Some children might have difficulties in using their hands. Compatibility with the text to speech and supported uh, reading softwares. And the time limit extensions for responses that have time limits. And again, I'm thinking of my friends with dyslexia. They just needed a tiny bit more time, you know, so that the, the, the two hemispheres of the brain could, could, could find the bridge. And that was it. It's so simple. But we can make life complicated to children when it comes to inclusive education, often due to ignorance. We do not know. Professors, teachers are not always prepared. Now, examples of inaccessible materials are uncaptioned videos, content that is organized randomly and without order, formatting that cannot be adjusted, and so on and so forth. And I would like, before moving to the second part of this, uh, uh, rem these remarks, uh, to share with you a case study for inclusive practices in schools and classes, uh, written by Lila Dale McManus, that I want to share. Now, Mrs. Brown has been teaching for several years now, and um, is both excited and a little nervous about her school's decision to implement inclusive education. Over the years, she has had several special education students in her class, but they either got pulled out for time with specialists or just joined for activities like art, music, lunch, and sometimes for selected academics. She has always found this method a bit disjoint and uh, has wanted to be much more involved in educating these students and finding ways that can make part uh, that can allow these students to, to fully participate in her classrooms. So she knows that she needs guidance in designing and implementing her inclusive classroom, but she's ready for the challenge. Yeah, she is. And looking forward, forward to seeing the many benefits 
she's uh, been reading and uh, hearing about for uh, the children, their families, their peers, herself, and the school as a whole. Yeah, she's ready for that too. So during the month before school starts, Mrs. Brown meets with a special education teacher, Mr. Lopez, and other teachers and staff who work with her students to coordinate the instructional plan that is based on the individual education plan of the three students with disabilities who will be in her classroom as of the upcoming year. So about two weeks before school starts, she invites each of the three children and their families to come into the classroom for individual tours and get to know your sessions with both herself and the special education teacher. She makes sure to provide information about back to school night and extends a personal invitation to them to attend so they can meet the other families and children as well. And she feels very good about how this is coming together and how excited and happy the children and their families are feeling. And one student really summed it up when he told her, hmm, you and I, we are going to have a great year together. So the school district and the principal have set out communications to all the parents about the more to inclusive education um, at uh, Mrs. Mrs. Brown's school. Now she wants to make sure she really communicates effectively with the parents, especially on some of the parents of both the students with and without disabilities that have expressed hesitation that having their children in an inclusive classroom would work. So she talks to the administration and other teachers and uh, with their okay, she sends out a joint communication about two months into the school year with some questions provided by the book, creating inclusive classrooms. Um, um, you can find it, it was published, I think in 2001. And the questions are, for instance, how has being in an inclusion classroom uh, affected, so, sorry, how has being in an inclusive classroom um, affected um, your, your child academically, socially, and behaviorally? And please describe any benefits or negative consequences you have observed in your child and what factors led to those changes. Another question. How has your child's placement in an inclusion classroom affected you, parent? Please describe and benefit any um, or benefits or negative consequences for you. And the third question, what additional information would you like to have about inclusion and your child's class? So she plans to look for trends and prepare a communication that she will share with parents. And she also plans to send out a questionnaire with different questions every couple of months throughout the school year. And she found out um, that um, uh, about the move to an inclusive education approach for uh, at her school, she found out that this worked pretty well, but she was working very closely together with the special education uh, teacher, Mr. Lopez and reading a great deal about the benefits and the challenges, determined to be successful. She's especially focused on effective, inclusive classroom strategies. Now her hard work is paying off. Her mid-year and end of the year results are very positive. Students with and without disabilities met their individual educational plan goals and the spirit of collaboration um, um, pervades uh, her classroom and she feels this is the whole uh, school that somehow contributed to that and they the whole school started practicing inclusive education and the children are happy and proud of their accomplishments so the principal of course compliments her and parents are very positive relaxed and supportive yes this is a pragmatic implementation of the sustainable development goal of the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goal number four, education and of CRPD. Second part now, 
Finally, the COVID-19 crisis and education with some references to Latin America. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we know, is adversely impacting those with and without disabilities and vulnerabilities in society, but definitely it is negatively, negatively affecting education of those who have been disadvantaged in society, reinforcing their pre-existing inequalities, align the trajectory for the future of our society. Is that the future we want? Now, even before the pre-COVID-19 uh, you know, period, persons with disabilities were less likely to access education. Imagine one in three children with disabilities of primary school age are out of school compared with one in seven without disabilities, a situation which is further exacerbated by those living in already fragile contexts. So persons with disabilities are more likely, as we know, to live in poverty, experience high rates of violence, neglect and abuse, and, and, and intensified socioeconomic and environmental inequalities. However, education when accessible, education when inclusive, education when available is the laissez passe to dignity and to move towards the future of well-being we want for us and for the planet. The pandemic is intensifying these inequalities and producing new threats. There are more than 70 million persons living with disability in Latin America and the Caribbean, all of whom are more susceptible to direct and direct vulnerabilities related to the pandemic. And as of March this year, 16 Latin American and Caribbean countries has suspended classes at all levels of education. And Brazil has imposed localized closures while gaps in access to computers and the internet and limitations in skills for their home use by persons with disabilities prevent learning from home. And this takes a toll on parents who have now become not only caregivers when needed, but teachers as well. So the direct effects of school closure takes a huge toll on children, including isolation from community and friends that are necessary to develop the social skills. And you know, this confinement, disruption of routine, um, lack of access to training caregivers and school fees, what are we going to do to avoid and overcome these issues? Now, in the current phase, we are addressing the post-pandemic future and the inclusion of persons with disabilities as a central promise of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and persons with disabilities who faced exclusion in employment before this crisis are now more likely to lose their job and we most likely experience greater difficulties in returning to work. Hence, inclusive education for adults is an urgent matter to be addressed. And the 44th Industrial Revolution we are living in requires at least familiarity with technology if we want to find employment that guarantees a decent income even to sell our products to the nearby market, for instance, if we're small entrepreneurs. So we will not be able uh, to discuss about technology, te the technological divide today. And for this, I invite you to participate to the Commission for Social Development. We in DESA are supporting and is taking place next February 2021 because the policy theme will be about digital technologies, the well being, and social development. So I think that the issue of um, inclusive uh, education and digital technologies uh, should be brought into the conversation. Now, at the, at the end of my uh, sharing some thoughts with you, I was given quite a bit of time. I hope I touched some points of interest to you all. The third part is about the United Nations. The United Nations, as you know, has ongoing efforts towards disability inclusion. And the efforts are many in so different directions. 
seven of the 2030 agenda's targets make explicit reference to persons with disabilities. And yet, all the agendas of sustainable development goals and targets, in my view, should include persons with disabilities as its central and transformative premise to leave no one behind. Recognizing persons with disabilities as contributing members of society and ensure their vital role in the development at all levels. To see disability is not just acquired when we were born or because of a sickness. There are conflicts and wars and natural disasters and accidents while we're working or car accidents. Or so unfortunately, the reasons to acquire a disability are so many. For, you know, we say one billion persons with disabilities, it's a generic number. I mean, the number unfortunately increases exponentially daily because of the reasons I just mentioned now, besides the age that unfortunately with it often brings also disabling conditions. So, um, I would like to, to, to tell you that it's really, really important to address also the inequalities when it comes to inclusive education due to the um, lack of access to information and uh, uh, lack of access to facilities that, uh, that create an enabling environment for students with disabilities, parents and teachers with disabilities. Um, environments have to be uh, accessible, inclusive, and as I always say, also usable. It's not enough for me to have access to a school because they eliminate uh, the, the steps. Uh, if once I am inside of the school, I cannot easily use the toilets, the phone, or reach the blackboard. So yeah, the place, the school is accessible, but to me, it's not usable. Now, we believe that the development of an effective multilateral response to the COVID-19 crisis will pave the way for resuming the progress towards the SDGs, not only, but really for thinking about what kind of future we want when it comes to inclusive education. So with your engagement, your engagement, we needed to call attention to policy choices and integrated approaches that can help ensure that no one is left behind including women, youth, older persons, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, refugees, migrant minorities, whoever needs to benefit and enjoy uh, education, and it has to be inclusive. Now, with persons with uh, disabilities, uh, since they are their own agents of change, we can build together an inclusive, accessible, sustainable world for everyone breaking the barriers of isolation, discrimination, and offering models for navigate the current situation, including remote work and distance learning. The perspective and, uh, you know, and, and lived experiences of persons with disabilities are integral in the creation of innovative solutions to these challenges. So in conclusion, the Zero Project has made amazing contributions and has raised uh, awareness to this issue. And, now, and, and, and our united ability to adapt to new global situations, even pandemics, in that we people, and I don't want to say people with and without disabilities, we people can design innovative education content and systems for our present and future well-being of the planet and the people. I wait uh, to see you together, maybe with a major side event, we might or you might wish to organize at the margins of the Commission for Social Development next February to tackle the issue of inclusive social development using digital technologies for the well-being uh, of all and uh, to promote socially sustainable development. Thank you so much.